Scott? Scott? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Magnus Seistek from Rent is Wealth. And I'd like to welcome you all here to our special webinar with the 91 Group. And we've got uh, three very special guests appearing on our talk. We'll talk about uh, investing, about South Africa in the global context, and how the markets have been performing and um, how we expect them to be performing in the future. So thank you very much to all those participants. I'd just like to welcome one after the other. We're going to have Dwayne Cable from 91. He's the co-manager of the Global Franchise Fund. And thereafter, the very well-known Jeremy Gardner, who is, of course, very well-known to clients of, of Brentest. He's been a speaker at many, many of our seminars. He's been a director of, of formerly Investec for many years. And of course, as you all know, now know, it is the 91, uh, and that is their new name. So before I start with my talk um, and, and make a couple of points, um, we'll see if we can get the slides going. We, the title of our talk or the, is, to, is In Search of the World's Best Fund Managers. If we can just step back for a second and, and, and uh, from a South African investment perspective. Offshore investing until, in fact, late in the 20th century was illegal for most South Africans. Those who could get money offshore did it illegally and then the gates started opening. And as time went on, people started becoming more and more involved in offshore investing. And now we have a situation that we live in a global world. Most uh, foreign exchange has been abolished. You can take large amounts of money overseas. And to summarize that trend, which has been happening for a long time, is that it's just normalizing what investors in other parts of the world have been experiencing for a very long time. In other words, they are free to invest anywhere in the world any asset class in the world, and you can therefore select the best fund managers in the world. And that's what we at Brentist have been doing for uh, quite a long time. We went out quite early, 2010, 2011, to start looking and searching for what we consider to be very good active managers that can beat the index or their benchmarks over time. And we've managed to do so, and one of the funds that has consistently done that and that is the 91 Global Franchise Fund. And we'll get back to that in a second. And both uh, Dwayne and also perhaps Jeremy will comment on that. But just have a look at, before we go on to my very short presentation, um, let's see if I can get onto my, my slides and I've overshot. Um, I wanted to show you before we start talking about markets, just some, some um, recent developments from Brentest. We were very lucky and I'm gonna brag a little bit, so bear with me. We have, only last week, Brentest, the company, was awarded the top wealth manager in South Africa for the second time in four years. We're very proud to say that we are um, um, very proud of that. And that two of our relationship managers our MD, Brian Butchard, who operates in Cape Town, and Andre Basson, who is in the Stellenbosch office. They were appointed as the runner-up and also third, second runner-up as financial manager of the year. So we're very proud of that. <coughs> so let's move on to my talk before I hand you over to, I think Dwayne's gonna go first. There is a slide that again, as you can see that for 15 years now, I was surprised when I saw it, I started going back, when did the underperformance of South Africa relative to world markets start? And the share, the, the, the slides in front of me show that, I think the turning point was about since 2005, <coughs> pardon me, the, over a 15 year period, the JSC has underperformed the global markets. And in this case, I'm comparing our performance with the Dow Jones and the S&P 500. Those are two very important benchmarks in the United States. But you'll see for a very long time, the JSC was outperforming those markets. 
But the turning point came around about 2013, 2014, 2015. And since then has been, in fact, a one-way street. So uh, we did very well on the back of commodity booms. Uh, we had a retail boom in South Africa, and we were one of the better emerging market countries to come out of the uh, 2008 uh, financial crash. But something that's been going wrong in our markets, and I'll, these slides will show to you that it's been underperforming for a long period of time. If we can move on to the next slide. You'll see that if you price this in dollars, <coughs> the South African market, particularly volatile from a dollar investor. If you're sitting in, in New York, investing money and uh, investing in South Africa, you must know that it is not an easy ride. It is a very bumpy ride due to the volatility of the currency. And that just shows you how extremely volatile the RAND returns can be. I beg your pardon, the dollar returns can be over time. But be that as it may, we've got the big upswings and the downswings in dollar terms. And again, over the last four or five years, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 have just pulled away from the SA market, enhancing the overall performance um, figures. So again, from an overseas perspective, timing as far as investing in South Africa is very important due to the, due, due to the exchange rate. If we can quickly <coughs> price these returns over 10 years in, in, in brands, and if we compare ourselves to those various indices, right down at the bottom, unfortunately, you will see the JSC all share total return over 10 years, a mere 244% over 10 years, and when you compare that to the NASDAQ of 1,328, and I'm not saying you should, that has been a spectacular performance by, by the NASDAQ, but if you compare us to the um, S&P 500, that's gone up 767%, and the world return of 569, you can see if you wanted to create wealth or protect your wealth, you needed to be in offshore markets, and I think that's what we've done at Rentist to a great extent with our clients. So that's the 10 year underperformance of the SA market versus the rest of the market. There's the same return tables, but in, in, in charts, in, but in dollars, our market in 10 years has produced zero return. And when you, if you were a foreign investor, had you started exactly 10 years ago, you might have had different returns depending on when you entered or exited our market, but over a 10 year period, a dollar investor had made no money. Whereas you made 540% in the NASDAQ, the technology sector, the biotechs, and even on a, a total world return, you've more than doubled your money. So the horror story continues on a five year basis. We have the same, our market doing particularly bad over the last five years. We bet in RAND terms, we made 108, uh, a big pardon, 8%, not 108. 8% over a five year period, which is equivalent to one, one and a quarter percent per annum. Whereas the rest of the world bounded ahead 200, 300% over the same period of time. Now, just to illustrate, if you look really carefully at this chart, I compared uh, uh, one of the offshore asset swap funds we use on the local market with one of the more popular local equity funds. A million rand invested five years ago in both these funds. What is the outcome today? Well, the outcome today, your money in the PSG equity fund, which excluded NOSPAS for some reason, your returns have been minus, what's it, 231,000 rand from a million rand. In fact, you get less. Had you invested that money into the MyPlan Global Macro Fund, you would have 2,036,000 rand in your bank account. And in fact, this was about a month ago. I think the difference has even increased over the last month or so. But just to show the real effect in purchasing power, for the, for the difference between those two outcomes, you could buy a small house and a small car, and you can still have the amount of money in the PSG fund. And I'm not picking on PSG, I'm just using this as an example of the variation in wealth creation between the local market and the offshore market. So the local market has not created wealth 
And, and we also start seeing it, I might, I might make mention of the fact that our pension funds are being put under severe pressure. There again, I've compared the My Plan Global Macro Fund with the Alan Gray Orbis, which also shows that, you know, even with local asset swap funds, you can do extremely well. And I think if I do the same chart with the 91 Global Franchise Fund, you'll have the same kind of return outcome. Just to show you, to, before I end up my talk and some commentary going forward, this is, and again, I'm not blaming anybody or I'm not naming the company, but yes, a, a very large retirement annuity fund from one of the big insurance companies. And it shows you that as a result of Regulation 28, which controls the foreign exchange ex exposure, <coughs> pardon me, um, this particular fund, and it's a very large fund, and it's still heavily marketed, you've actually lost 25% in real terms on this fund. You've, you've, in, 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 in nominal terms, you're down 5% over five years. So in other words, you've got less than you put in rand for rand. And on an inflation-adjusted basis, this retirement annuity fund, remember it's a pension fund, is down 30%. And I found that not so severe as this one, but generally, I'm finding a lot of these funds that have had no growth for five years or seven years. And we've been advising our clients at Brentis for a long time to get out of RAs if you're older than 55. Take the one third, take the cash and reinvest into a, uh, a new living annuity, whether it's with the 91 platform. And there you can get the, all the funds you want and you can get 100% offshore exposure. I've done it with my own money. It's, it's not a secret that my living annuity is with, with the 91 platform in an offshore fund. And last year I did 35%. Now you compare it to the local market. So there's a major crisis developing in retirement planning in the traditional market for South Africans. And you will expect to hear a lot about this going forward. So on that note, I'd like to um, hand you over to Dwayne Cable. As I said, we've been looking for um, fund managers that we can talk to, that we can relate to, that we understand their thinking. And the thinking from Ibrantis' perspective is we like think, uh, uh, investing along themes, or in, in the case of 91, a, a, a franchise. And you'll find this very interesting. Um, a lot of people ask, which country do we like and what currency do we prefer? And we say that we don't look at that. We look at global trends. And then we find funds that are good at investing at those global trends. And the Global Franchise Fund is a very good example of that kind of thinking, which is a global type of thinking. So I'm handing you over to Dwayne. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Nice seeing you. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Magnus. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Magnus has said, it's been probably an incredibly tough in market environment for, for many South African investors. But today I'm going to spend a little bit of a time explaining the Global Franchise Fund and how we're seeing the world and why we don't think it's all doom and gloom for SA investors. As Magnus has said, if you're prepared to widen your horizons, we are still finding exciting opportunities in the market. So what makes 91 unique? I think uh, when we look at the 91 quality team, I think we are, have an experienced, well-resourced, globally integrated team. And I think this is really differentiated relative to maybe some of our other competitors locally. I mean, you will see we've got within the quality capability at 91, while we've got a team based in South Africa, we also fully supported by teams based in both New York as well as London. And if you look at the tenure of um, the investment professionals, I think the, the stability that we've seen in the team, the fact that we've been globally integrated has been a major differentiator relative to peers and really has allowed us to get the great outcomes that we've delivered for our clients um, with, through the, the Global Franchise Fund. This slide basically just touches a little bit on performance. And what I wanted to unpack with this slide was maybe just to carry on with some of the themes that Magnus has said. I mean, we know for South Africa it's been an incredibly tough uh, environment. But if you look at the global franchise returns, which I'm showing you, and what I want you to focus on is really that bottom table. 
And what I'm showing you is the returns of global franchise in US dollars. So this is not rands, this is in US dollars relative to the world benchmark. So the MSCI all country world index. And you will see when you look at our active return, which is our alpha net of all fees delivered to clients, you will see that consistent track record of market beating performance over all time periods. You will, what I've shown you over a one year period that US dollar return of 9.3%. If you were to look at what that would have been in RANDs over the last year, that was net of fees just in excess of 30%. So again, for South African clients, really attractive returns and a track record that we are quite proud of. I think what's pleasing and where it also shows the differentiation in terms of our approach at 91 is that when you benchmark the returns of the global franchise, not just to South African global managers, but the best of breed global managers, whether they be based in New York, London, the returns stack up um, really well. So again, a track record that we are quite proud of. This slide I think is important. And what I want you to focus on here is clearly with COVID, we are in a very uncertain world. And what I am showing you is the performance track record of the 91 Global Franchise Fund, net of fees relative to um, the market, which is represented by the pink bars, which is the all country world index over different market cycles. And with the Global Franchise Fund, it's got quite a long track record. So this fund was established in 2007 and Clyde Rousseau, who's the, the main portfolio manager has been managing this fund since that time period and continues to manage the fund today. And you will see, if you look at the track record of this fund, while it maybe lags in roaring bull markets because of our more defensive positioning in more moderate markets, uh, which is what we think we are in at the moment globally, you will see the defensiveness of our holdings, the quality of our businesses allows us to outperform the market. And then in tough markets, I mean, especially the ones that we've seen in March, Given the defensive characteristics of the businesses that we've invested in, we have seen how we've been able to protect our clients' capital, experiencing significantly lower drawdowns um, in our clients' capital than the market. More importantly, if you put all of that together and you look at our track record since inception, it has allowed us to outperform the markets over all those periods. So I think what we have demonstrated as a team is the resilience to be able to deliver in different market cycles. Now touching on some big picture thoughts. I think as investors, there's loads of questions that you're all asking in terms of how do we make money in this very uncertain, volatile world? And these are just some of the big thoughts um, that, that we've been contemplating as a team. So clearly we've seen financial markets buoyed by strong central market liquidity. Um, and this is for someone like myself who managed portfolios through the global financial crisis when Ben Bernanke was the, the um, chairman of the Fed and we heard the term helicopter money. And at central banks around the world pumping liquidity to do whatever it takes to support markets. And that's what we've seen. And because of that, there's been a significant rally in global markets off the lows of March. Despite now touching on what is an incredibly tough macroeconomic environment. I mean, we knew that um, quarter two was probably the worst quarter for markets. I think some of the stats that we've seen with economies um, shrinking by up to 40% in the second quarter of the worst data we've seen for a number of years, if not in history, and certain companies that even came through the global financial crisis unscathed had a significant drawdown in, in their profits. So clearly this is, these are unprecedented times, but it's sort of stimulated um, the central bank liquidity that we have seen. I think the important question for investors is how do we respond to all of this? And the message we would like to leave is that countries around the world will be responding to COVID and recovering at different rates. And just because of COVID, a country that has struggled pre-COVID 
post-COVID is not automatically going to find a magic formula towards growth. And I think that's very important when, as investors, you're thinking about how to allocate capital. I think the example I would use is South Africa. We know South Africa was in an incredibly tough space before COVID. Um, and COVID has made things even worse. Whereas countries like the US, countries like Europe, they will recover from COVID and then assume their natural growth path. And we are still able to find businesses in these economies that are still able to thrive even in a COVID world. We think emerging markets, especially emerging markets with twin deficits, South Africa being one of them, that are sitting with significant debt, um, unable to balance their budgets, will continue to lag. And therefore, we think investors need to look elsewhere for growth. I think what has come through clearly is China is leading the recovery. We've done lots of work on Chinese businesses. Uh, we've followed them. We've seen as they've reported, um, the economy is booming. Um, the consumer, the Chinese consumer is strong. And, and those opportunities, we think, that are in our portfolio will likely to continue to benefit investors. Just summarizing just our thoughts, I think in this incredibly uncertain, volatile world, a bias to high quality compounding global equities, we think that's the strategy to deliver the returns investors are looking for. And that's how we are positioning um, the portfolio. So how do we find, um, define these franchise companies? We know quality, as they always say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but how could I summarize the five key attributes that we look for in companies? And firstly and simply, we like companies that are, have got strong competitive advantages, um, hard to replicate, um, strong brands. The example I would use there is a company like Estee Lauder that has been around for a, a long time, has got leading market share positions, great brands. Or we look for companies with dominant market positions and stable growing industries. An example I would there, use there is Visa that's in the portfolio. Companies with low sensitivity to the economic cycle. So they add an element of defense in the portfolio. And again, an example there I would use is a Nestle, which is very defensive, not really dependent on the economic cycle. One of our holdings like Roche, which is a pharmaceutical um, business, extremely defensive. Um, or the fourth characteristic is companies with healthy balance sheets. And we've seen within the COVID crisis has caught many businesses unaware where they've had to do rights issues, had to beg shareholders for money. These are not the type of businesses we invest in. We look for business with strong balance sheets that can come through the cycle. And then businesses that have got sustainable growth and businesses that can grow with, with strong moats Businesses like Microsoft that is in the portfolio that continues to grow and benefit. I mean, you will look at how tech has changed the world with everything that's moved to online. You know, with Microsoft, with their Teams platform, more and more people using online, working from home. Microsoft is a great beneficiary for that trend. And we've seen as Microsoft released their results a few weeks ago, it has actually been a massive beneficiary of COVID and has delivered excellent returns for, for us within the portfolio on behalf of clients. How do I say what's important for us within the 91 quality team? And, and this is maybe a busy four slides, but I'll make it very simple for you to understand. I think the first chart, which is the top, is we look for businesses with high quality profits. And that's represented by something called free cash flow. The old saying that cash is king. And ultimately, uh, we look for businesses when you look at that accounting earnings, because we know how easy it is in today's world for accounting earnings to be manipulated, where accounting earnings equals cash earnings. And the average for our portfolio is 100%. So when you look at the cash earnings or that accounting earnings, that is the same as free cash flow. Whereas for the average company in the market, that rate is 60 to 65%. So whatever earnings they show, for whatever dollar of earnings they show, it's actually only 60 to 65% of free cash flow they're generating. That's not the businesses we invest in. We invest in businesses that have got 100% free cash flow conversion. The second chart I show is just, we look for businesses with growth 
And the track record of global franchise over a number of years has delivered strong growth in free cash flow. And encouragingly, and based on our bottom-up analysis of the companies that we own, we think the track record for growth for the next five years is still quite encouraging. And we think that is reasonably exciting when we think about the portfolio. The bottom left um, chart shows just balance sheet strength as represented by the net debt in a business to its profitability as represented by the earnings before interest, tax and depreciation. And the simple um, line, the green line there, which is shows global franchise, the businesses that we invest in are in a net cash position. So in other words, they've got no gearing on the balance sheet, they're sitting with cash, they can navigate through the cycle. Whereas the average business in the market, which we don't invest in, has got significant gearing on their balance sheets. That adds an element of risk. And then just lastly, we look for businesses that generate high and sustaining returns on invested capital. So you will see for global franchise on average, for every dollar that our companies invest in their business, they're making 25 um, cents back each year. Whereas for the average business in the market, they're only making back less than 15 cents for every dollar that they, they are putting in. So again, shows the superior profitability and quality of the businesses we invest in. How do I make this simple to understand how the, portfolio, the stocks that we own the portfolio work for you throughout the day? And yeah, I show you when you wake up in the morning and you're showering, you may be using your Johnson's and Johnson shampoo. Um, that's a stock we own in the portfolio. Uh, maybe before you get back to your office, um, 8 a.m. making your coffee um, Nespre with your Nespresso capsules, that's Nestle. Or whether you are using your Office 365 or Microsoft Teams, or you're going out for lunch and you're swiping your card, your credit card and, and Visa, or, or maybe around lunchtime where you, you're feeling a little bit peckish and you want an ice cream you, and you get your, your Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And for those of you who have got kids, know they love gaming. My son loves FIFA. And whether they're playing FIFA, I keep telling him that he's got to keep playing FIFA because he's making more money for my clients. So, so the, the, the gist of what we're looking for in the portfolio, whether you're watching Fox News as represented by, by, by Fox Corp, or before you even go to bed. And um, I mean, I used here Ness, uh, Nivea, um, but the same would apply for Estee Lauder. My wife uses Estee Lauder Advanced Night Repair. And when she puts that on before going to bed. So you'll see my portfolio of businesses that is represented within Global Franchise works for my clients throughout the day. And those are the types of businesses we like because they add an element of certainty in an uncertain world. Just a quick stock example I wanted to touch on, which is Estee Lauder. I'm actually the analyst on the stock. And this gives, should give you a sense of the type of businesses we look to invest in. And this you will see from the slide or the table on the right is that Estee Lauder is the market leader in prestige beauty, only rivaled by L'Oreal. And, and the two of them are vastly superior to any other player in the global prestige market. Estee Lauder has consistently grown market share. This is a relatively new holding in the portfolio. We bought it in March when um, as a result of COVID, the stock traded um, at around about $160 a share. We bought it, it has since recovered to about $200 a share, but we still like it based on valuation. But why do we like it? We like it because prestige beauty is a growing category. And in a world that we think is going to struggle to grow, the prestige beauty market will continue to grow at five to 6% per annum. We know in the world of Instagram and social media and, media and your selfies that skincare has become so important. And prestige beauty has really benefited from these trends. I know Estee Lauder has some of the best in class brands within the space. There's the Estee Lauder brand, there's the Clinique brand, there's MAC Cosmetics, there's Le Mer. Um, all of these brands, I can guarantee you, if you go and scratch in your, your you know, the bathroom closet that you'll find these brands there. They are well known. And Estee Lauder is the actual market leader in skincare. 
and that continues to grow. The last point I would make on Estee Lauder is that about 30% of their sales come from China. And we know that the Chinese consumer loves Instagram, they love cell phones, they love taking pictures, they love looking after their skin. And we've seen significant growth within Chinese skincare and Estee Lauder has been a huge beneficiary. So we think this is one of the highest quality businesses in our universe and we think remains quite attractive. The second stock example I will just touch on briefly is electronic arts. You will know it uh, for your kids EA games. FIFA is probably, <coughs> sorry, FIFA is probably one of their flagship games. It represents about 30% of their sales. And we'll see in the world of stay at home, digital entertainment, that gaming continues to grow and accelerate. We've seen the trend to online gaming for some time. And a business like EA that's got a strong portfolio of brands, a great business, has got significant growth runway, we think offers incredible opportunities for investors. And hence, we think it demonstrates the type of businesses that we look to invest in, businesses that have got growth, that are generate high margins, that are very defensive, and have got structural growth tailwinds. This slide um, shows you the top 10 holdings of global franchise as at the end of June. And just a few points I'd like to um, pull out from this slide. I mean, firstly, you will see it's a very concentrated portfolio where 52% of the portfolio is in our top 10. You will see the names in those portfolios, names that you will know well, whether it be Visa, Microsoft, Moody's, Nestle, Johnson & Johnson. These are all household names, but they are great businesses. You will see their return on invested capital is 42.7% as the, for the top 10 holdings. And to remind you, the earlier slide I showed you is the average business in the market has got a return on invested capital of less than 15%. So these are high quality businesses. Again, to show you the top 10 holdings, their free cash flow conversion is well ahead of earnings at 124.6%. So showing you they've got high quality earnings with no accounting trickery. So again, those are the characteristics that we like. And then lastly, you will see for the, the collection of businesses we own, they've had an attractive growth profile over the last five years. But importantly, looking forward, we think the runway for growth for many of these businesses will actually continue in a post-COVID world. And we think that's what makes us excited about the portfolio, is that we know growth is gonna be scarce globally. We know growth is very scarce in SA, if not going backwards. And we can find businesses in a world that can still deliver growth. And if they can grow their free cash flow, and given that they are trading at reasonable valuations, we think this is a great outcome for clients. Uh, the question I often get from clients is, but Dwayne, don't you just own all the famous names? Can't I just do that? Don't you just hug the benchmark? And what I'm showing with this slide is, yes, there's Visa, Microsoft, Moody's um, that are well known that we are overweight, but we only own a collection of 28 stocks in global franchise. So a very concentrated portfolio and only seven of the top 50 um, stocks in the all country world index is represented in global franchise. So you will see the active share, which is basically showing how different global franchise is to the index is incredibly high at 92%. Simply put, we are very different to the index. And you will see some examples of what's not in global franchise. Apple's not in there. Amazon that we think is a little bit on the expensive side, Alphabet, Facebook, Alibaba, those are not in, in, in the portfolio. So we do think we offer our investors a differentiated portfolio of high quality businesses in a concentrated portfolio that, can, that will be able to give them the outcomes they're looking for.
Then just as I start to wrap up with my second last slide, just showing you some of the value characteristics of the global franchise portfolio. We have spoken about the high returns on invested capital they generate. I've spoken about the strong balance sheets where they're sitting in the net cash position and the growth that comes out of these portfolios in terms of free cash flow. For those high quality businesses, we would expect them to trade at a premium to the market. But what I'm showing you with this slide is by some valuation metrics and enterprise value to EBIT is the one I want you to focus on. Uh, and you will see that our portfolio actually trades at a discount to the average of the market. And that's what we think is exciting because the market continues to underprice quality. For these high quality businesses, one would expect to pay a big premium. And the example I always use for car fans is that when you want to buy a Mercedes Benz or BMW, you expect to pay more than you would for a Kia. When we look at the market, they seem to be offering us those high quality cars at a discount price, which we find exceptionally attractive. Just lastly, talking about sustainability and the businesses that, that we invest in, you will see the footprint of carbon intensity for a fund like Global Franchise is substantially less than the average stock in the market. So we think the businesses that we invest in not only give us the growth, not only give us the returns, but is making a sustainable impact, positive impact on the environment. So in conclusion, if I think of how we position for the market, yes, the markets have been buoyed by central bank liquidity. I think we would add an element of caution that yes, there's been a strong recovery of the lows. So valuation risk is more balanced. We certainly have still been able to find opportunities to deploy capital. In our view, high quality global equity still provide the best opportunity for growth for SA investors. Our bottom up forecast for global equities that we've invested in for the next five years, thinks we'll be able to deliver return in rands in, our, in a range uh, compound per annum between 11 to 15% per annum in rands over the next five years, which we think relative to the opportunity set and relative to how well we've done, still provides an exciting opportunity for investors. Lastly, I think it's important to remain an element of defensiveness. And that's what we have in franchise when you construct the portfolios. The defensive businesses that we own, because they've got high barriers to entry and pricing power, we think position us to be able to outperform in this uncertain world. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and hand over to, to Jeremy for his part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, and hopefully you can all hear me. Um, Siobhan, you'll give me a call if you can't. Okay, right. Well, what do we do now? Let me, um, let me start off by saying, Thank you very much for logging and I hope you enjoy what I've got to say today.